Okay, well, it's time for lecture number, well, lecture number three, lecture C in our series of eight lectures. Um, today, as, uh, as should be apparent from our session with Practical this morning, we are talking about two major categories of, of activity for a novel genome. Number one, assembly, and number two, annotation. Now, I've spelled those out in a little bit greater detail on the overview page, because this used to be a terrible zoo of, of uh, algorithms that were crammed all together in one lecture, and it was really too much. So I've, I've actually calved off some information to try to make this a little easier to, to tackle for everyone. So from the assembly side, everyone should be sure that they understand paired end sequencing, because this is one of the technologies that's made uh, the process of assembly a whole lot more straightforward. We have the problem of repetitive DNA uh, that can cause problems with assembly. And we're going to talk about a data structure called a KMER. And I want to make sure everybody knows what a KMER is, because when you're looking at the output from this software, you'll frequently see KMERs mentioned. And I'd like you to know what, it, what they mean. Uh, from there, we're going to talk about the annotation. After all, a big, long contig is not the same thing as a genome. That's the sequence of a genome but it still lacks the annotation of a genome. So how do we find the informative bits of a genome? We're going to be talking first about hidden Markov models. <coughs> HMMs are very much an advanced topic, but I want you to understand the roles that they play uh, and how they're, what kinds of things they're good at. Uh, we're also going to talk about alignment algorithms. We mentioned BLAST this morning. BLAST is one of the most prominent examples of, a, of an alignment algorithm, so we'll discuss how they work particularly emphasizing substitution matrices. Substitution matrices are the scorecards that we use for figuring out how well an alignment uh, describes a relationship between two sequences. And then finally, we're going to come back to this question of the interpro problem. How do we find functional bits of sequence when we look at the full length sequence of a protein? So, uh, as uh, we mentioned yesterday, we're working our way through this big plot of all these different uh, uh, topics of discussion within bioinformatics. Today, we're coming right down the left end. So, base calling is no different than yesterday. We, we spoke about that problem uh, specifically in connection with FRED, the FRED algorithm for assigning probability of error for individual base calls. That's great. Not going to repeat that today. Repeat masking is a problem uh, that um, that comes into, 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 into play because we have so much DNA that gets repeated around our genomes. So we'll talk about that as a problem. From there, we're going to talk about de novo assembly. De novo assembly. This is the case where you don't have an annotation, you don't have an overall structure for a genome, and you're trying to figure out all of the sequences from these tiny little patches of read sequence. So de novo assembly. From there, we'll, call, we'll move on to the problem of gene calling. I mentioned hidden Markov models, just to skip to the punchline, we use HMMs to find genes. So this is the gene calling problem. Finally, functional annotation. When you have a new sequence for a protein or for a transcript and you want to understand what kind of functional uh, uh, capabilities it has, understanding what motifs are within it really matters. So let's start with paired end sequencing. I want you to imagine that we have an insert. Now, we call it an insert kind of for historical reasons. It used to be that we would make vast libraries of sequences that we might potentially try to sequence. And then we tried very carefully to decide which insert sequences were most interesting to us, which ones were going to give us the best ability to walk through a region of, of genome that we hadn't sequenced yet. So, we used to use these as inserts. We would insert those into uh, uh, E. coli or whatever, grow up a, a pile of that sequence in order to amplify it for sequencing. That is not necessarily uh, how things work today with whole genome shotgun, but the name kind of lingers. So I want you to imagine that these inserts could be fairly long. Maybe you have 10,000 nucleotides, right? That's a fairly long stretch. Most of the sequencers that we deal with today have nothing like that, that sequence length capability for their sequencing. Some do, some do. Very specialized sequencers can do hundreds and hundreds of, of nucleotides quite happily. But most of the sequencing that we see done is, is relatively small patches of sequence. So I want you to imagine this long, floppy bit of DNA, and this end, we're going to sequence a tiny little patch of sequence, and this end, we're going to sequence another tiny patch of sequence. But most of it is just this great unknown. 
Now, generally speaking, we're not going to have the chance to come back to this sequence at another time. We're not going to come back to this insert and grab another patch right here that we happen to be missing. So just imagine this long bit of sequence, uh, a long piece of DNA, only the ends of which we have sequenced. Okay? This is the approach that we use for paired end sequencing. It means that we have each end of this DNA fragment, we have a, bit, a small patch of sequence. And they're paired because they come from the same piece of DNA. But they're not overlapping in where they're producing sequences. The sequences are pretty far apart from each other. So you can then imagine, well, how, how could you get at these? One of the reasons why it was convenient to sequence the ends comes from the fact that we knew what we cloned this DNA into to begin with. So we knew that there was, there was a vector sequence here on either end. Maybe these are adapter sequences for a plasmid in a bacterium, for example. If you know the sequence that falls just outside your, your region of interest, you can design primers against that that allow you to begin building in, reading in this end of the sequence, or reading in that end of the sequence. This falls because we know what those sequences are on either end. We make a little tiny little, uh, a little uh, primer here, and a little primer here, and <coughs> off we run to the races. Now we can sequence in maybe 500, 600 base pairs on the ends, if we're using old school sequencers, Sanger style. Okay, so this concept is an old one. Uh, you can see that I, I've uh, cited a, a paper from 1991 for this. Now, 1991 for me is a, a memorable year. I was, I was driving. I, you know, I was about to graduate high school a year later. Um, but I realized 1991 might seem an eon ago to you. So 1991 uh, is a long time in biotechnology. So much has shifted in time since then that it might seem like the dark ages. So this paired end sequencing is a technique that reaches forward in time, even though sequencing, um, sequencing technology has changed tremendously, even though uh, the, um, the ways that we go about deciding which sequences are going to get produced has, have changed enormously, we still use paired end sequencing because it's still valuable to us. And we're going to emphasize why that is in just a second. But let's talk about this de novo assembly, assembly problem. Before, I was waving my arms about to indicate we had a little patch of sequence here and a little patch of sequence here on a very long, unsequenced piece of DNA in between. You can think of that sort of like a barbell in, in a way, right? So you've got the weight on either end and a big pole in the middle. So think of each of these little barbells in dark blue and light blue as a different, patch of, a different uh, piece of DNA that was subjected to, sequence, uh, to paired end sequencing. So here we have one that's got a little blue patch here. This part was sequenced. And then there's some indeterminately long stretch that wasn't sequenced, and then we have its paired end down here. Two patches of sequence, opposite ends of the same piece of DNA. Now, you can imagine that if you, uh, if you look for overlapping sequence between different, uh, different barbells, different inserts, you will see that in some cases you have an overlap of 25 or more nucleotides. That's kind of a number that you hear thrown around a little bit. So think of that as, I'm going to call that the K value for now. You've got a, a K value of 25 nucleotides that overlap between this patch of sequence and this patch of sequence. They're not from the same piece of DNA, they're from different pieces of DNA, but they overlap just the same. So that's really valuable to us because now we can project downwards through these stretches of, of DNA that overlap in their regions to produce a deduced target sequence. So every place where there's a solid red line down at the bottom of the slide, we have a place that is covered by at least one of the sequencing reads that we produced in this content. Ah, there's that term, it already popped out. I couldn't wait even a couple slides. So here we have a contiguous region of sequence that is covered from one end to the other by these little blue patches. Those little blue patches are the part that were actually subjected to sequencing. They overlap. We were able to detect that, and so we were able to deduce a larger contig sequence from these stacks and stacks of reads. All right, so that's everything going well. Now, there's a little problem that should be apparent from this as well. If you haven't got a whole lot of stacking in a particular region, you may have a break between successive contigs. And that's not so comfortable. If, if your sequencing reaction isn't producing enough reads, you may have a very low N50 value. I think we talked about N50s this morning. 
that reflects the fact that your sequence is all that your contiguous sequences are actually quite small, little puddles of sequence hither, thither, and yon, but nothing that stretches for megabases, for example. So that's not great. But these little paired ends are going to help us out, and I'm going to just show you graphically why. So imagine that you have this contig and this contig. You have a break right here. Does everyone see that little break there, that little gap? But look, this piece of DNA has one patch of read in this contig, and at the opposite end, this very long piece of DNA, has another patch of sequence in the next contig. That's the magic of paired end sequencing. We don't know what the sequence between those two is, but we know that, th that it is possible to have one piece of DNA stretching between them. That gives us the ability to know that this contig and this contig must be next to each other, even if we don't have all of the sequence to fill in the space between them. Okay? So that's, that's the magic of paired end sequences. Yes? May I just repeat that? Sure. Um, we have a, piece of a single piece of DNA. We don't have its complete sequence because we only have a little patch of read here and another patch of read there on the other end. We don't know the full sequence for this region because there's a break here. There's this little patch right up through here where we have no reads. But we do know that this contig and this contig are neighbors. And we know that because this contig, contig has a patch of sequence from uh, one end of a read, uh, sorry, uh, one end of an insert sequence, and the other patch of sequence falls in a different contig. So effectively, that, that bridges across this pair of contigs to tell us that they're close together and their orientation with respect to each other. All right, so de novo assembly runs into piles of problems just like that. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about biology for a moment. I hope you don't mind. Lots of our DNA does not relate to protein sequences. As a proteins guy, that makes me feel very sad, frankly. But only about 1% of our genomes relates to a, code, a protein coding sequence. There's a whole lot more that's regulatory in one way or another. And there are plenty of regions within our genome that are conserved very carefully by evolution that we don't know the functions for yet. So when, before we say 99% of our DNA is junk, let us be careful to realize that a lot of this DNA has some function, it's just not determined yet. All right? So, that said, there are plenty of regions in our genomes that are junk. We call them junk DNA, it's a technical term actually, but that's fine. We're going to talk about the taxonomy of our junk DNA. I'm being really rude to genomics people here, sorry. So, we have things like variable number tandem repeats, such as, such as microsatellites and mini satellites. We have transposable elements. Transposable elements, can, they get around. They're curious little bits of DNA. So these transposable elements may be DNA transposons or retrotransposons, bits of RNA that write themselves into DNA. You can get long terminal repeats, long interspersed repeat elements, and short interspersed uh, elements, and all kinds of interesting things. Now, in, the, in this list, I've highlighted one in particular that I, I, that I find really fascinating, and that's alu. Alu. So ALU is the, is the name of a restriction enzyme that we can use to recognize uh, where these ALU sequences appear in our, gene, in our genomes. I've, I've read some sort of speculative bio, biological literature on this subject, and, and one of the things they argue is that along, around the time the primates were splitting off from everything else, there was a bit of a war going on in the genome of, prime, of, of the things that became primates. And these, these, th this war was effectively against DNA that was making more and more copies of itself throughout our genomes. Now, you frequently hear people talk about um, epigenetics, right? The, acti the activation or silencing of particular regions of our genome by, for example, methylation or histone code or something like that. There is a, some argument to be made that this, uh, this rise of epigenetics in the line leading to us was <coughs> partly involved in response to this infection that things like ALUs were spamming themselves all over our genomes, and epigenetics are one way for our bodies to resist the further spread of such, se of such parasitic sequences. Personally, that's a little dramatic, but I kind of like drama in my molecular biology. So imagine the primates never existing because this parasitic sequence was just spamming itself all over the place. That's kind of a dramatic scene, isn't it? 
So I, I, this is uh, uh, one of those cases where these sequences have been turned off over time by, by uh, other mechanisms to prevent their spreading even further through our genomes. Does anyone know how many ALUs we have in a standard human genome? I would love to know that number. I think it's quite large. So if you just go looking through your genome for things that look like genes, things that look like genes, we find that many of them are pseudogenes. They're things that are not genes that produce proteins that we're interested in. They're bits of DNA that sort of activate themselves from time to time. So I find that very unnerving, but there you have it. So these repetitive bits of DNA can cause a lot of problems when it comes time to sequence. So uh, we're going to need to screen those out, if at all possible. Now, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of my story a little bit to talk about the use of an alignment algorithm. That's one called Smith-Waterman. It's a very, very uh, significant advance in, in the field of, of sequence alignment. However, it's a little hard to explain, and I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on it. The short version is that if you want to find um, wherever a short sequence of, occurs within a genome, something like Smith-Waterman is really, is really quite fantastic. It is not, however, very, very fast. For that, you really want something like BLAST. So, CrossMatch is an example of uh, how Phil Green's group dealt with the fact that we've got these repetitive sequences showing up all over our sequencing reads. It has a little, a small database of, uh, called RepBase of these repetitive sequences. And when given RepBase and a, for example, chromosome uh, sequence to evaluate, it will try to find every incidence of every pseudogene or every repeated uh, sequence. That's really very powerful. And it does kind of something that I find a little odd. At the end of the day, when it finds these regions that look like the repetitive DNA sequences, it will, it will replace them with N characters. N characters. So instead of an A, C, T, or G, you've got a bunch of Ns. Just a whole section marked out with Ns. So if you recall, we mentioned that N is kind of special as a code in sequence. When you have an N in sequence, it usually represents something that has an indeterminate letter there. We don't know what letter should be there. So effectively, by marking out these regions, you, you can imagine a, a document from the intelligence services coming back covered in black pen, right? All those things that they don't want you to see, they've redacted. Redacted, redacted, redacted. So you can imagine then that having passed a genomic sequence through uh, rep based through the repeat masker algorithm, we now have all these regions that have been marked that have been blacked right out, we no longer know what residues are there because the software says, I know what this is, this is trash, don't worry your little head about it. Okay? So repeat masker does this to uh, protect us from finding genes that we know are, are just this repetitive junk. All right, so what happens if we were to leave repeats in place? All right, now this is a little confusing, so I'll, I'll try to take this step by step. Imagine that somewhere in the genome, we have a gene A and a gene B, and in between them, we have a particular repeat. Maybe it's an ALU sequence. Will you, will you humor me in that? Can we call it an ALU? Great, we're going to call it an ALU. That's an ALU sitting between an a and a, a gene A and a gene B. Over here on another bit of the, DNA, uh, of the genome, we have a gene C and a gene D. But once again, they have an ALU sitting in between them. Is it the same ALU? It's not the same ALU, there are different parts of the genome. It might be the same sequence, it might even be an identical sequence, but it is not the same ALU because these are completely different areas of the genome. Now on this, we're showing a little patch here called X. Everyone sees X. That's a read. We have a particular read running from, or maybe even a Comte, running from the area near A into this repeat, and then it stops inside the repeat. Over here, we have another read called Y, and it starts inside this other repeat of similar sequence and runs on towards gene D. Everyone sees the scenario. What happens if you try to assemble that? If you try to assemble that, it might appear that sequence that read X overlaps with read Y through no fault of their own. They just happen to be going into and coming out of repeats of similar sequence. Messy, huh? All right, what we see then is that by accident, we may think gene A abuts a repeat that abuts gene D. That's a mistake. 
So we can't have that. We need to screen out these reads, uh, to screen out these regions of reads or regions of contigs that have this great resemblance to pseudogenes. Because otherwise, we'll think that things are very close together when in fact they're quite far apart. Okay. It's a little like if my brother takes a picture by a, a Honda Fit in the United States, and I take a picture next to a Honda Jazz in South Africa. A Honda Fit and a Honda Jazz are the same vehicle. They're just sold under different names. So you might think that my brother and I were both sitting next to the same car, but he's 9,000 miles away, right? Same concept, except here applied in reads. All right, so those repeat regions can cause problems, causing us to think things that are quite far apart are actually quite close together. All right, now this, this next one can be a little controversial. Imagine that I have a great, great many reads. In this case, we are looking at a, a block of sequences that all have the same length. As we look across it, we see that there are a few places where a letter in that stack disagrees. Not here, this is all C, 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 A, 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 C, 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 A, 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 all fine there. But look at the situation over here. C, C, T, C, C. Everyone sees that? At this place, we have this problem that the, these different letters are in, are, are in disagreement to begin with, and we see that the sequence error scores, the FRED scores that apply to those, are in many cases quite high. So you see this top C, this, this one in the very first sequence, it has a score of 20. What's the probability that that base call is an error? One in 100. One in 100, thank you very much. Thanks for listening so well, thank you on that one. All right, so this top one, yeah, we could take it early, but that is not an impressive score. That's a one in 100 error. And we've got more than 100 base calls uh, in, in this by a long throw. Next up, what about our next C, 35? Everyone ready to tell me exactly what that equals? <laughs> it's okay. It's one in 10 to the negative three and a half. <laughs> I'm not gonna compute that right now. But that number is not a great, it, it's a, a pretty good score. It's better than this one though. Look at this. This T, sandwiched in with the rest of those, disagrees with the others, and it has a score of 30. Now, 30 is not a bad Fred score, is it? What's 30 mean? One in a thousand. One in a thousand. One in a thousand chance of error. So you might think, well, that's really, really outstanding. I, I'm not going to say something that's got only a one in a thousand chance of error. But look, we've got this 35 down here for this C. And here we've got a C with a score of 40. One in 10,000 chance of error. Sometimes, even a person who's very, very sure of himself or herself needs to be outvoted. It's true. It's kind of shocking. So in this case, this software is going to say, T, you've been outvoted. The C's have it. And so that gets written over with a new letter, C, with a score of zero? What on earth is that? Mean? What it means in the context of Arachne, which is the, the software that, that put this, uh, this figure together, is that we put no reliance whatsoever on this particular reads letter at this location. We're just outvoting it, forcing it to be zero. Now, I just want to mention, um, I don't, did I have the, oh, here we are, in the, in the slide before this one, this is also uh, from the paper and in introducing Arachne. I want to mention that Mr. Batsiglow here, I, I can't pronounce his name properly, I'm afraid, but this was his PhD work. He wrote, as, as part of his PhD, a whole genome shotgun assembler algorithm, one of the very first, and got it uh, used by some of the biggest genomics labs on Earth because he demonstrated that even on a high memory PC, you could assemble the whole genome of the fruit fly, if I recall correctly. That's a very, very big deal. You may think your PhD project is not going anywhere, but sometimes they go to the stars. And this is a fine example of that. Okay, so here we see that this Letter has been outvoted. On we go. Just to hammer this point a little bit more, you would think it's almost a quiz question, actually. We see that we have inserts that use paired end sequencing, but they're shown in yet another way. The first time I was wiggling my arms back and forth and explaining that these are patches of sequence. The second time I show you a light blue bar with dark blue bars on the sides. 
Now, I'm showing them as arcs. I have this long arc of one insert sequence with a little patch over here and a little patch over here. Paired reads, these, this paired end sequencing, enables us to link together contigs to know that these regions of contiguous sequence about each, are, are, are next to each other with maybe some amount of space in between them. So when you have something like this, you may be able to generate relationships like this where this, this contig is a neighbor to this one because it shares sequences on this end that align with the right end of that one. We also need to know that its right end links with the left end of this. But there are some particularly long contigs here, very long ones, that have a tiny patch of sequence that are on, opposite, are on contigs that are not adjacent because this one fits in between them. Right? So sometimes you may have a, a segment that's so long that it skips over a contig and get into the next one. Being able to rationalize all of this is one of the things that makes whole genome, sequence, uh, whole genome sequencing possible. By sequencing both ends of pieces of DNA, we're able to determine the, the relationships of neighboring contents. All right. Now, we're going to move into some of the more advanced algorithms used for assembly. Um, I'm doing this largely for name recognition. I want you to see the names of the people behind these algorithms and know that they exist so that when you see this term used in a seminar sometime, you'll be, you won't be lost. You'll know exactly what they're talking about. All right? Now, KMERS are one of these concepts that show up all over the place in sequencing literature. So let us imagine that we have a 100 uh, base pair read coming from our sequencer. Now, let us equally assume that we are interested in KMERS of 25, 25 nucleotides. So imagine we've got our string of, I'm, I'm, for just a moment, imagine there's only one read in the world, one read of 100 letters. We're now going to dissect that up into every set of 25 consecutive letters that we can. Okay? So where's our first one? I'm, I'm, I'm going to imagine that it runs from this black cap to this black cap right here. So here is residue number, uh, number one. This is residue number 100. How many KMERS of 25 length can I produce from a 100 nucleotide sequence? What's that? 75. 75. Oh my goodness. How many did you say? You say four. Ah, all right. Now we have two very different views of this problem. So in yours, you immediately assume that these KMERS don't overlap. So you can carve out the first quarter and the second quarter, and the third quarter, and the fourth quarter. But you made a different assumption. You assumed that we have a sliding window, right? Uh, we have a camera that starts at residue one, and another camera that starts at residue two, and another at residue three. Everyone sees that, right? In this case, we want to generate every 25 consecutive letter region from this 100. So you're close, but it's not 75. 76. You've got the off by one error. And those things always creep in. Computer scientists are hit with these all the time. So everyone should be clear now that a KMER is a series of consecutive letters drawn from a read. So when we make a KMER catalog from a whole pile of reads, from millions of reads, that's a huge data structure to think about. What it means is that every stretch of 25 consecutive letters from sequencing reads is represented in our catalog. And we have a count of how many each time, uh, how many times each of these 25 letter sequences appears across this entire read library. That's kind of astonishing, isn't it? So if you have a, a whole genome shotgun set from which you've produced your reads, and you're grabbing out every possible set of 25 consecutive letters from it, you're going to have bazillions of, of, of uh, KMERS. When we use software that, like we did this morning with Trinity, they are relying on a KMER library in order to do a very rapid assembly of that entire uh, data, uh, of the set of transcripts in this case, from Chia. Or if you're trying to produce the sequence of every chromosome from a whole genome of a, a more complex species. So what can make this a little bit confusing? Well, 
First off, just as a, as a point of value, if you have different reads, you really only need to consider that they overlap if they have k-mers in common. Okay, so if I set k to be a very large value compared to the length of the read, let's say I have 100 base pair reads and I select for a 50 length k-mer. I have a bit of a problem here because now, unless these reads overlap for half of their individual lengths, I'm not going to get a match. So I need to set this k-mer length relatively low, especially when I have short reads for doing my assembly. Everyone sees that? If I require an overlap of 24 nucleotides and the, soft, and the sequencer is producing 25 mers in its reads, I'm only going to see things that are off by one nucleotide from each other. That's a lousy, a lousy way to do my assembly. So K, uh, the, the choice of K-mer is a reflection of the type of sequencing data that you've produced. All right, now, we require then that if we're going to detect an overlap of a pair of reads, they must overlap by at least K residues. So if I have two reads that do overlap, but they only share 10 residues in common and unset k to 25, that's, that's my bad luck. It's not going to detect that they have any k-mers in common as a result. Next, we've already seen that sequencers can sometimes they kind of mess up sometimes. Occasionally, you'll have the letter C when you really should have a G. If you resequence the thing, you would see it. In cases like that, you may have an all but one match just because of a sequence error. So that's kind of awkward as well. So I, I hope everyone sees that the, uh, the occurrence of k-mers in common between different reads gives us the ability to detect that they overlap. Everyone good with that? All right, now along the way, we're going to do some things like look for k-mers that are present at far higher copy numbers than everything else. This is an alternative way of dealing with repeats. Because if you have repetitive DNA, uh, example, for example, from ALUs, you're going to have a huge number of reads that include that region, and you're just going to strip those out because they're just going to cause you heartache and pain in the end. Okay, on we go. Now, this brings us to the De Bruyne graph. Now, I pronounce that like an American, so I, I would encourage an, uh, a proper Afrikaner here to explain how to pronounce De Bruyne. Anyone? <laughs> De Bruyne is what Americans call it. Okay, I'm just saying. Anyone going to take a stab at this one? De Bruyne. De Bruyne. Okay, De Bruyne. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it sounds rather different. I mean, Bruyne, right? Okay, that's good. Thank you. All right. So, uh, De Bruyne. Right? <laughs> sorry. I, I shouldn't joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, a De Bruyne graph. Large, I'm, I'm still mispronouncing it, aren't I? <laughs> I'm so sorry. A brain graph is used for us to find the best path through all of the k-mers in order to create an assembly. That is mind-blowing to me. So I, I'm... Let, let's... Okay, now we started with reads, and we mentioned that they were paired ends and so on, and that was all great. But then we dissected these reads into k-mers. And we're all more or less comfortable with where those came from, but we've already lost, we're already one step away from what our data actually represent. Now we're going to get into the really trippy world. So imagine that we have a k-mer at this position. One of the ways that we can interpret this catalog of k-mers is that we want to move from this k-mer to another k-mer that's just one nucleotide uh, shifted to the right from that. Everyone sees that? As we move through the sequence, we do so by stepping from Kamer to Kamer to Kamer, where these are, are, are all but one matches with each other. All right. Now, uh, there, there's a little drawing of that here. See this? Uh, this is an example of a Kamer of length 7. And it, oh, here they've stepped 2 uh, to GGC, so they locked off the first two. Here we moved another two to step to the next, and so on. This is a walk from Kamer to Kamer. At, at this point, things get a little hairy, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to note that there are two different approaches that are spelled out here. One is to find the Hamiltonian cycle 
which means that we're going to visit each k-merk only one time in trying to make this massive uh, conte from this. In the other, we're making a Wailerian cycle. How would you pronounce? I, I, I always learned his name was Euler, E-U-L-E-R, but I, I think you pronounce it differently here. How would you say it? When? Okay, well, great mathematician. So Hamiltonian versus Wailer, Wailerian, two different ways to interpret these Kamer catalogs. And the idea in a Wailerian cycle is that you only want to visit each edge once. Okay, so the De Bray graph is the set of, of Kamers. How we transit that is what's going to output a sequence from it. This is where things go so crazy mathematical that I really don't think things get better. But just the same, there are people who are curious. So to ensure I get it right, we're going to read it. Modern short read assembly algorithms, this is, very, this is a very universal strategy, construct a de brain, de brain graph by representing all Kamer prefixes and suffixes as nodes, and then drawing edges that represent Kamers having a particular prefix and suffix. Imagine these as the overlapping regions between successive Kamers. For example, the Kamer edge ATG has a prefix AT and a suffix TG. Finding an Wailerian cycle allows one to reconstruct the genome by forming an alignment in which each successive Kamer from successive edges is shifted by one position. This generates the same cyclic genome sequence without performing the computationally expensive task of finding a Hamiltonian cycle. Now, for some people, that's very sensible business. Um, if, you're, if your business is graph theory and you're accustomed to thinking about suffix and prefix libraries, this is all very straightforward, I think. Personally, I find it a little bewildering. And if you really want to know more, I'm going to strongly suggest that you click these links or follow, uh, read some of these articles, because they will have a lot more to teach you about that subject than I. But I would like you to know that the brain graphs are a way that we build from a Kamer catalog a long sequence. Okay? I have in the past asked quiz questions about that one. All right. Let us imagine that everything has gone brilliantly. It's gone brilliantly. We have this long sequence that represents a whole chromosome from a eukaryote, or that represents one circular chromosome from a bacterium, for example. Things have gone great. But, Sequence is not the end for genomics. Sequence is where we start. So now that we have assembled a contiguous sequence that represents a chromosome or that represents a whole organism, we need to figure out where, what a roadmap looks like. What are the parts of this genome that we actually care about? So for this, we're going to start with our old friend, the hidden Markov model. Markov chains are a fairly complex topic. And I'm going to try to walk you through this one with a little bit of theory and a little bit of example, and hopefully you'll have some sense that in the end of the day, hidden Markov models help us define genes from raw sequence. Okay? So, here we have a biological feature. It doesn't look like a biological feature, but we frequently think about things this way, and I'm going to try to justify that to you. We have some start of that biological feature, and we could go to this part of that biological feature and then come back to state two, and then we might go to a state three A and then down to a state four. That doesn't make any sense at, at this level, but I want you to think that if, for example, you are trying to find amino acid sequences that correspond to a transmembrane domain, there's kind of a transitional part on the outside of the membrane that gives way to the, uh, the part of that protein that hits the, 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 the tails, basically, of, of the, the bi lipid bilayer, oh, sorry, no, the heads of the bilayer, then you have this part that's, that's transitioning through a very hydrophobic region on the inside of that lipid bilayer, and then again you're passing in through the inner membrane, and finally you're in the internal region. So, on the whole, you know, we're, if, if my body here, my chest represents the, the lipid bilayer, we have a little bit of the protein on the outside, a little bit of the protein on the inside, and then we've got these transitions through. So you might imagine that state zero represents the extracellular environment, and state four represents the internal environment of the cell. And these other states represent ways that proteins have used in order to pass through a membrane. 
Those are the biological phenomena. But what we have are sequences. What we have are sequences. The sequences don't come with labels. They don't come with labels. We need to infer what this part of the sequence is responsible for, given our biological model of that problem. Is everyone following me? Okay, so the sequence is the outward expression. The labels that we put on things are our biological models about that thing. So here, we think of this biological model as being the red-orange red, red part. That's the biological model. From that, we have sequences that may result. Here we've got two different sequences, either of which could result from this model. Now I'm going to add in a couple sets of probabilities, so bear with me. We have two different transitions out of state zero. This is to say arrows that fall within the model itself. So from state zero, I could go to state 1A, or I could go from state zero to state 1B, one or the other. And these, these transitions have probabilities attached to them. You see that T01A, this is the transition from 0 to 1A, has a probability of 0.8. Over here, we have a probability of 0 0.2. So a very quick question, what is 0 0.8 plus 0 0.2? 1, all right. This is to reflect that we are going to make a jump away from this node, from this state, and we're biased towards going to state 1A but one-fifth of the time, we would expect to go to state 1B instead. All right? Now, at the next stage, jumping from state 1A to state 2, it's obvious. You're always going to jump from state 1A to state 2. There is no other es escape from state 1A. S similarly, we see that state 1B continues on to state 2. But look at what state 2 does. It's kind of odd. You see this little looping arrow right here? State 2 can return to itself. This is to say that we could just perpetually extend out, never leaving state 2. It has a probability attached to it, 0 0.5, and we have a probability of 0.4 or 0.1 to go to these other steps below it. So, in our biology, state 2 can extend out and give us longer sequences. That's the only uh, state here that I've written. So, transition probabilities reflect moving from one, one part of our biological model to another. For example, from the outer membrane to the transmembrane region. That's an example of this kind of transition. And we see that sometimes these states can come back to themselves. So transition probabilities are one thing you should know about, and the other is what's called an emission probability. So we have this biological concept, and from it, we know particular sequences may arise. So the emission probability is a tie to, uh, to any of these cases where a state gives rise to a letter, that letter being part of our sequence. So in this case, we had six letters that came from one repeat of state two. So state two, in effect, gave us two of these letters. Over here, we have letters one through five that came from a single pass through with no repeating back. So transition probabilities are about movements within the model. Emission probabilities are about what letter appears there. So I'm going to give you a clear-cut example of emission probabilities being associated with biological state. What is one of the most common features of a gene's promoter? I think you got it. The Tata box, exactly. Why do we call it a Tata box? Right, right. A promoter sequence is frequently has a tata -ta box with it because it emits a string of TA, TA letters in sequence. So when you're sitting in a promoter as part of a biological feature, you might expect the, the observable output of that to be TA, TA, TA. All right? So that's a case where we have high emission probabilities on T and A, but low probabilities on C and G, so long as you're within that. All right, I know this is complex, by the way, so I'm, I'm not going to be testing you on the intimate details of this, but I, I want you to understand why these things exist and what they're good for. All right.
Now, because this is bioinformatics, we cannot pass away from hidden Markov models without some mention of the algorithms we use for dealing with hidden Markov models. We start with Baum-Welch. Baum-Welch is an algorithm that we use when we have a whole bunch of examples of some biological feature in sequence. And we want to train the model on what all those probabilities should be for moving within the model and for exporting or for emitting a particular letter of sequence. So Baum-Welch trains us when we have these sequences to which we're going to apply a model. Next up, we have the forward-backward algorithm. It's kind of a creative name, I think. Uh, so we now have a new sequence, and we want to determine the probability that this sequence actually corresponds to this model. So think of this in the context of a transmembrane domain. You have some model that reflects what kinds of sequence changes we should see as something is moving through a membrane. We now have a new sequence, and we want to ask, does it contain any transmembrane domains? The forward-backward algorithm gives us back a probability that says, this is a match or this is not a match. And finally, the Viterbi algorithm. I think the names of these are just wonderful. So the Viterbi algorithm is once you have a high enough score for a sequence and you want to know, well, what parts of the sequence actually conform to parts of this model, the Turby is going to give you that answer. So having created a, a gene model, for example, or a transmembrane model, it's going to say, this part sits at the outer membrane, this part sits at the inner membrane, this is transmembrane, this is outer leaflet, inner leaflet, etc. Wild, huh? So people have been using these algorithms now for a long time. You see that this paper comes from 1993. I think it was just a review article talking about uh, some of the different advancements that have been made in these three algorithms. And certainly, hidden Markov models have had a tremendous impact on our ability to detect genes. So when I say, how many genes does a human being have, and you answer back 20,000, thank a hidden Markov model. So in this case, we have examples of these states. So imagine that we have an intergenic region state. This is just random sequence that shows up there. Maybe we have some vague idea of how much G, how much C, how much A, and how much T may appear here. We move out of the intergenic region into a promoter region, a 5' prime UTR. Does anyone remember what UTR stands for? Untranslated Sorry? Untranslated region. Untranslated region, exactly. So here we have the promoter, we have the 5' prime untranslated region. Now, you might have a very short cycle through this, because you could have a single exon gene, and you can see that from there it's just promoter, 5' prime UTR, the exon, the 3' prime untranslated region, a poly A tail, and then boom, you're out. But sometimes you have multiple exons separated by introns, and you want the hidden Markov model to tell you where these boundaries are. There are clues in the sequences that show us where these breakpoints are. So you could have an initial exon, then you might go into an intron in any of three frames. From that, you emerge into another exon in a, in a particular frame, and then pass back into an intron. Sooner or later, you bounce out into the final exon, and off you go. Now you have another gene that's got a complex intron-exon boundary structure. Hidden Markovs do a lot of work for us. So these are very challenging problems, and any time you have a, uh, a series of biological states that are leading to a sequence, hidden Markov models are a very, very good option. I believe that I've included, uh, oh yes, back here, this Nature Biotechnology article is a really good one. So Sean Eady has done a lot of work with hidden Markov models. He publishes one of the most commonly used ones called Hammer, um, uh, uh, frameworks for developing these models. But this, you'll note, is only two pages. Nature Biotechnology frequently writes primer articles to teach people about basic concepts of bioinformatics, and this is one of those examples. I, I strongly recommend you give it a read if you want to understand these better. Okay, that said, it's time for us to talk about alignment. It is currently 3.04 p.m., so I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep us well within time today, if at all possible. In the past, this lecture can drone on and on, and I'm not going to allow myself. Was it Blaise Pascal who once wrote a letter, a very long letter to someone, uh, and in the letter he wrote, please pardon me for the length of this letter. I did not have the time to write a short one. <laughs> I thought that was the best idea ever. It's all right. Okay, so 
Why do we need to align sequences? We spend an awful lot of time in bioinformatics working on algorithms to align things. So why do we need to bother with this? We start with the problem of recognizing orthologs. As I mentioned this morning, and I think I've already hammered on the point here, we frequently determine the function of a gene in a novel organism, a novel sequence anyway, by comparing it to sequences that we've already annotated. So even though there are not a lot of cat biologists in the world, we frequently can associate a, a function to cat genes because they, have the sim because they have similar sequences to those found in other organisms where we have done more research. So finding these orthologs really matters, and forming a good alignment is how we would accomplish that. Recognizing paralogs. Now, I've gone to an altogether different kind of sequence relationship. At first, I said I was recognizing orthologs, and I'm talking about paralogs, but that's just sort of messy. So let's, let's try to break down the difference between those two. You and a yeast have proteins in common. You do. Millions and millions of years, billions of years for all I know, separate us from a yeast in evolutionary time, and yet it is still possible to determine that the way you carry out glycolysis and the way a yeast carries out glycolysis bear strong relationships to each other. You can look at those protein sequences and see that they're very similar. So that, when we talk about the same gene in two organisms, we're talking about orthologs. I mentioned trees this morning as a particularly problematic place to do genomics because they have so much duplication of their genomes over time. They are, they are the key example of paralogs. But don't be fooled, your body has a lot of, of paralogy as well. We have many cases in our genomes where over the span of evolution, we have gained many, many copies of some genes that have differentiated from each other in what functions they play. Somebody once really blew my mind by telling me that crystallins, uh, a protein we use in our eyes, is actually kind of a, a, a reshaped uh, enzyme from another time. So we can find similarities between crystallins and other proteins that are catalyzing reactions in our bodies. So our bodies are, have uh, a lot of tread wear on them. They, they, they've spent a lot of time figuring out new uses for old genes. And paralogs are their answer to that. Finally, recognizing conserved regions. If you see that a particular region of, the, of your DNA doesn't change over evolutionary time, there's probably some force that is uh, some force of selection that's keeping that sequence that particular way. I mentioned earlier that there are regions of our genome that are not in protein coding genes, and they're maybe not in recognizable regulatory structures, but those sequences don't change with time. They don't change generation to generation. So if there's some sort of selective force that prevents the, that, that removes members of our population because they don't keep uh, a consistent sequence there, it's worth knowing. So finding conserved regions matters. Now, I, I can't spend lecture upon lecture on the subject of alignment, although it's kind of fun to do so. I, I used to teach a whole semester class on this material. So let's, let's try to focus on the big level questions, uh, the, the, big, the big playing field questions. First off, if you are trying to align a whole sequence to another whole sequence, you are performing a global alignment. A global alignment. Sometimes, you're looking for the presence of a very small feature that may occur in multiple copies in another sequence. Uh, and a fine example of that would be the example of alus, if we're trying to find every alu that appears in a genomic sequence. So in a case like that, we're doing a local alignment. We're looking for where this small patch of sequence shows up, uh, lights up on a longer sequence. Sometimes, we want an optimal answer. We want the provably correct answer and we want to know the very best possible score for any place we could scoop this sequence in this genome. In that case, we're doing an optimal scoring system like a Smith-Waterman or something called a needleman wunsch More frequently, though, we have so many sequences to compare among at this point. Very, very frequently, we find we're willing to settle for a pretty good match if we can get it very quickly rather than a provably best match. That's called a heuristic approach. So uh, finally, evolutionary distance. If you are comparing organisms that are very, very similar to each other, for example, in the same species, 
you probably want to do that comparison on nucleotide sequence. But if you're comparing your genes to a, a yeast's genes, you probably want to do it at the protein level instead, because protein sequences tend to change much more slowly as a function of evolutionary time than do nucleotides. All right. It's after lunch. It's almost three, it's a little after 3 p.m. And yet we're still going to talk a little bit about math. I hope you bear with me on this one. Odds ratios are a hugely important mathematical concept showing up all over the place in bioinformatics. Odds ratios represent a comparison of two probabilities. Now I'm just going to steal my thunder here for a moment and show you the next slide. We're going to be looking at Blossom 62. Blossom 62 is so outrageously important in alignment uh, bioinformatics that no lecture about bioinformatics can really be complete without it. So, uh, Blossom 62 shows us odds ratios. Now, just as an example of uh, how, how language gets mutated, I want to point out that it doesn't just give probability ratios, it gives the log of probability ratios. Therefore, we call it a LODS ratio. Did everyone see that? We went from odds ratio to a LODS ratio because we threw an L in front of it. That's just our little cue that this is on a logarithmic scale. All right. Now, back when I was in graduate school, I did not understand what a big deal substitution matrices were. And I didn't understand that 20 years later, I would be giving a lecture about the content of what I was hearing from researchers who were announcing their results for the first time at the University of Washington. Hennikoff and Hennikoff, a married couple, uh, had managed to work together in publishing one of the most seminal papers of bioinformatics uh, in their production of Blossom. They created a database called Blocks. Blocks. It's no longer used, but it's, uh, it was hugely important at its time because Blocks showed regions of DNA that are very strongly conserved. So strongly conserved, in fact, that they had no gaps in them, ungapped alignments of these sequences. For example, a pyruvate kinase. This is one of your glycolysis enzymes. Grab that from a thousand species, stack them all together, and look at how, how tightly evolution has constricted these individual amino acids. So they argued that you can tell how well evolution will tolerate the change of one amino acid for another by how frequently we see that residue exchanged with another, that amino acid exchanged with another in these intersections, in these carefully conserved blocks. Now, a while ago, we were looking at a sequence alignment where we had all C's and one T there. So you can think of something like that except with amino acids. If you have a location where you see serine 50% of the time, threonine 40% of the time, and tyrosine 10% of the time, you can make every pairwise combination of those and count how many times one, one amino acid is exchanged with another. All right? If you have a whole pile of these, thousands and thousands of these blocks, you can begin to estimate how frequently these amino acid exchanges are allowed to be perpetuated by evolution. So, we have a count of how many times a given letter is replaced by any other. We can also compute the probability of occurrence by simply asking how many Y's in total, how many tyrosines total did we see across all of these blocks? And then you can say, well, my background probability for this uh, replacement is equal to the probability that I would find a Y replaced by the, uh, by, uh, uh, the background probability for a T, for example. So what we end up with is a pair of probabilities that we can take in ratio to tell us about the acceptability of this substitution, thus substitution matrix. Now uh, I'm going to mention one other, other thing. I always forget to check this number. These are going to be log base 2. I'm going to explain why that matters in just a moment. So here we go. This is Blossom 62. Let's start with the fact that the highest scores in the Blossom matrix are associated with what? A letter staying exactly the same. 
a letter staying exactly the same, is the most common evolutionary inference. So we look at tryptophan. Tryptophan is a very rare amino acid. It's, it's kind of expensive to build. So here we've got tryptophan. We can look up tryptophan itself. Oh my goodness, it's not going to show us the left edge. It's making me cry out. I'm just going to say this is W right here, okay? So we just chase our W over here, and we see that W replaces W with a score of 11. This is a log base 2 scale. Log base 2. So that means that W stays W 2 to the 11th times as frequently as you would expect by random chance. That's pretty astonishing. W likes being W, and it doesn't like being anybody else. Now, so this is our diagonal. The diagonal has all the high scores. This is a symmetric matrix. So if you see K versus R here, and K versus R here, they have the same score. So you could just lop off one side of this. We're gonna, not going to do that at the moment. So, I have highlighted in yellow anything with a positive value. That's because at zero, the probability of replacement between a pair of letters is exactly what you'd expect by random chance. So here, for example, we see that serine and, I think that's an E, yes, serine and glutamate replace each other just about as often as you would expect by random chance. That's not much of a contribution. It's not something you penalize something for in an alignment, but it's not something you're going to give it bonus points, bonus points for. Now, what do we see? We see that things like glutamate, glutamic acid, is exchangeable with aspartate, aspartate or aspartic acid. They differ by just one carbon, so they have very, very simil similar functional roles. They're both carboxylic acids. No big deal there. We see that something like leucine can become, oh, that's a isoleucine with a pretty good probability. And in fact, leucine can exchange with valine um, pretty acceptably. Isoleucine with valine is even more common. So what, how do we interpret that three? We saw a three right here. This three means that isoleucine becomes valine eightfold more often than you would expect by random chance. A comparison of two probabilities given on a log scale. All right. So I did a little bit of math there. We talked about probabilities. We talked about them in the log scale. In practice, how do you use Blossom 62? In Blossom, the, the easiest way to use Blossom 62 is to perform an alignment, and now you have one sequence stretched out atop another. You need to have some way to score whether it's a good match or a bad match. Blossom 62 gives us the answer on how to do that. Here we see that R and Y have been paired together. Now that seems a little weird at first. Arginine is a highly basic amino acid. Tyrosine has this big circular structure in it. So we can then look at Y versus R. Where did it fall? What's oh, right here? And we see that there's a minus 2 at that location. We write in our minus 2. Now E versus D, we already said that was a pretty good score. E and D are similar enough that we expect some replacement to be good, and in fact it is. We get a plus two score for that. G versus G, well that's the best situation we could ask for. Anytime an amino acid is exactly the same, we feel that we need to give it the best score bonus that we can. The score that it gets is a plus six. Similarly, when D is D, we get a six. When M is M, we get a five. L is L, etc. Several of these others are just passable. A plus zero, who cares? A versus T, well, it happens about as often as you'd expect. Over here, though, Histidine and isoleucine, they're not very similar biochemically, and so they get a pretty negative score. Now we want to ask, is this alignment worth anything? And simply adding these values together gives us the score. That's the bit score. Well, that seems too easy, right? But this is, in fact, how most of our scoring algorithms run when we score an alignment. So when we specified to BLAST this morning, that we want to use Blossom 62 as our, as our substitution matrix, we were specifying the parameters under which we would do our scoring. All right. Now, I, I have to mention a little bit about Smith, Waterman, and Needleman, Wunsch. These are local and global alignments. These are optimal algorithms. These use a technique called dynamic programming. Uh, it's, a, it's a technique I, I enjoy teaching to people. And I, I was asked if I would provide more examples 
of these uh, big O notations. So I decided to do one here. In this case, we have a sequence that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 residues long. And here we have another that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 long. In order to, co to compute an answer to the dynamic programming uh, alignment of these two sequences, you can see that we're going to have to add a gap here. After all, we're aligning an, an 8 mer with a 9 mer. That kind of implies uh, a gap somewhere, unless you've got, uh, you're matching like the suffix or the prefix sequence. So here we have this gap that's been introduced. So what are we trying to do? We, we have places like this G and that G where we have a possible increase in our score. We could do it up here as well. We have this G that can match here. We have this G that can match down here. We have this T that could be matched to that T. These are possible matches. So we're trying to find a path through this matrix that maximizes the score, but, in, but includes as few gaps as possible. So dynamic programming allows us to solve that in 72 steps, in essence, because not a, a nine residue sequence by an eight residue sequence. If this sequence doubles in length, the time required to solve the optimal alignment also doubles. If both of these sequences double in length, the time required to solve the problem quadruples, because it's times two times two. So we use this big O as just a way to talk about how long an algorithm is going to run as the set of data we feed it gets bigger. All right, so dynamic programming is a, a very valuable way to do scoring alignments, but because it's nowhere <coughs> near as fast as the heuristics like FASTA and BLAST, we just don't use them in uh, as, as many contexts as we do these others. So without further ado, let's jump straight to BLAST. BLAST is our killer app. I, the, the number of citations this algorithm has racked up over the years is kind of astonishing. I, it's, I think it's moved out of the tens of thousands. Um, it's an incredibly popular approach. But how does BLAST work? All too frequently, people will use the software via the web interface, and they have no notion at all what's going on. When you escape here today, you will have a better knowledge of that. So BLAST is going to start with a hypothesis that's a little sketchy. So let's, let's talk about it. In Smith-Waterman, we get a provably correct result, but it is expensive to do. If you've got a bazillion sequences of length average thousand, you're going to spend a long, long time aligning each sequence with every sequence in that database. So that's not really viable. We want to do it quickly. So BLAST is our answer. BLAST assumes that if you are going to align two sequences, Sequences you will find acceptably similar are going to have some regions in which they are identical. All right? So if you were trying to figure out uh, which strangers were actually twins, and you could, you could interview, uh, you could only interview them by the network, uh, you, you might have them answer questionnaires and look for similarities for brothers and sisters, but you might find that you had more regions of identical answers if you had identical twins. I don't think this hypothesis works, but it's where we're going with it. So imagine that you have similar sequences because of evolutionary pressures. You might think that regions such as the active site are so critical, so mission critical in what residues they have where, which amino acids appear where, that there are regions of identical sequence that can be used as a starting point. Imagine if the only sequences I'm going to compare to in the database as similar are those that have at least three amino acids in common with my starting sequence. That's the, that's the BLAST assumption. In fact, in later versions, they argued that you have to have at least two regions of identity in the, uh, uh, in the sequence before you would say it's acceptably similar. So we're going to find seed matches first. When you provide a query sequence, it's going to start by cutting it up into three-letter sequences, assuming it's uh, amino acids, and it's only going to compare, to, it's only going to attempt alignments with sequences that have at least two matches to these three-letter sequences from your query. All right, this is a big shortcut. 
So it uses a technique called a finite state machine. It's always kind of fun to act out the, the machine, but I'll try to just go through it a little more quickly uh, today. Once we have these seed matches, we know just a few locations where these sequences may be identical. But we don't care just about the identical regions. We care about regions of similarity around them. So we're going to start with these seed matches, regions of identity, and try to add on an amino acid at a time in this direction and in this direction to give us other regions of similarity that abut those that are identical. We'll talk about those in our next slides. Finally, we sort all of these maximal segment pairs. It's a very important concept. All of these maximal segment <coughs> pairs are going to be sorted by a, a, a score, the alignment score, that's computed just like we just said in Blossom 62. And we're going to display only those that are unlikely to have been random hits. And here we have a really huge throw-in by Carlin and Altschul, uh, who published in 1990 an approach that let us compute expectation values from these bit scores. So the E scores that we looked at this morning were a, 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 an additional feature that got added on top of BLAST so that we could score them by our, our typical substitution matrix route and in terms of expectation value. So we could avoid looking at things that were just fortuitous matches. <coughs> now what is a finite state machine? This is curious. So let's imagine that the sequence I've provided to my uh, BLAST interface is KSS, GSS, YPS. Uh, just as we mentioned a bit ago on KMERS, we're going to sub subdivide this sequence up into three MERS. So we want every three-letter combination that can be pulled from this sequence. So we have KSS, SSG, SGS, GSS, SSY, SYP, YPS. Everyone sees that? Those are all of the possible contiguous three-letter sequences we can dissect from this. Now we're going to organize those in a dictionary tree, sometimes called an aohoracic tree. We have only one sequence that starts with G, GSS. We have four sequences that start with S, SGS, SSG, SSY, and SYP. Do people see how I'm reading that? We have only one, one three-mer starting with K, KSS. Only one, C one of these three-mer starts with Y, YPS. Okay, we have now developed our Aho-Karasic dictionary tree, and now we pass the entire sequence database through that tree to figure out where any hit to any three-letter combination is a match. That sounds really impossible, but in fact, in computer science, this isn't that bad. So if you have millions of sequences, you pass them through this tree, and any time you get a hit, that's great. So we start uh, finding hits when we encounter this letter Y. Because if you start at the top of this, you can move to Y as one of your first steps. But when we move to the next letter, we see it's an N. We can't move from Y to N, so that falls away. In fact, we don't get any hits of three residues until we get to this region right here. We hit the S, that's all fine and good. The next letter is G, we can move to G, that's, that's brilliant. And the next letter is, is an S. Once we hit this, a little bell rings. That little bell is telling us we have a region of identity between our query and this sequence. Therefore, we can go ahead to compute a maximal segment pair. Everyone sees that? Okay. That means you're never going to find a similarity under BLAST if you don't have any regions of identity. Okay, on we go. We've now found, between a pair of sequences, this is another pair of sequences altogether, we have a couple seed matches. RPE is a match directly between these two. MCT is an exact match between these two. Those can be extended in either direction through other seed matches, in fact, to create a maximal segment pair. At this point, BLAST is trying to drive the score upward. It has a pretty good place to start. This, these three-letter sequences already score well. But it's going to try to find adjoining residues that can also include, that will also boost our score upward. If it goes too far out, it may end up in sequences that don't align at all, in which case it's, not really, it's going to just call it off and say, that's a, that's a hill I don't want to climb. So we start at RPE and MCT. 
Is A versus B okay? Yeah, it's all right. E versus D, is that okay? That's pretty good. We, I think we recalled that one got a two. A versus B, we already said was okay. So look, we, even with just that little bit of extension, we now have a region of nine amino acids that can be part of our alignment. If we push to the, to the, the, the N-terminal side, E versus B, mm, it's a little hinky, it's not great. F versus L, well, on, blo on blossom it actually looks all right. But then we get to something like this, P versus R, well, that's terrible. Proline and arginine are nothing like each other. We're going to have to incur a big negative in order to do this. Similarly, we can extend out this way. Again, we hit a proline versus E, and we're just like, ick. The scores are getting driven down too much. We don't want to extend further in this direction. So you think of the seed match as this place where the software starts, and then hopes that it can sort of zip together the uh, adjoining sequences in order to drive that alignment score up. It's going to stop at some point when it has the score driven down by too much disagreement between the two. So that, in a nutshell, is how BLAST works. That's a very, very quick introduction to it. But I hope that everyone knows about maximal segment pairs because they are, uh, they are the, the whole reason why BLAST is so, val uh, so valuable. Very fast screening of sequences versus by, by picking out those with seed matches and then an expansion of this region of similarity to find out what you can include that drives your score upward. Now, why do we bother with multiple sequence alignment? I have just the one slide about it this year. We, we may use BLAST if we're looking for a particular query in a database. That's all fine and good. But if you have a whole set of sequences and you want to know how you can adjust all of these to match to each other, a multiple sequence alignment engine is really needed. Frequently, we're trying to create phylogenies to understand the course of evolution for a set of sequences. And, of course, we're always interested in those bits of sequence that don't change, that are conserved in the face of evolution, so that we understand the, the parts of our genomes that, by not changing, show us that they are important. So, uh, ClustLW is just one of the algorithms that we use for this purpose. I want you to be aware of it. Uh, the paper is right there. There are certainly lots of web browsers out there. Um, but I'm not going to go further into it. Instead, we're going to talk a little bit about domains and motifs. Now, it's 3.32. I've I held up for 90 minutes. You've held up for 90 minutes. I don't see anybody sleeping. That's, that's really great. But we, we have to push through this last little bit, and then we're going to be done for the day, all right? So bear with me. At the top of this diagram, I have displayed something that I'm calling the central dogma of structural biology. The central dogma of structural biology. We always think about DNA gives rise to RNA through replication, uh, through, uh, through transcription, and RNA gives rise to protein through translation. That's a central dogma of molecular biology. But here, we're talking about the central dogma of structural biology. It's a very important thing for everyone to understand. We have sequences, and we spend a lot of time talking about sequences because bioinformatics has great tools for dealing with sequences. But, in the end, sequence is not what gets the job done. The ability of a molecule to function requires that it reach a particular structure. We talked a little bit yesterday about cystic fibrosis and the CFDR, the uh, conductance regulator. That chloride channel if you delete the phenylalanine in position 508, doesn't fold up correctly, and it gets packaged off to the, to the, the garbage chute of the cell to be digested up and started over again. Right? That's an example of a protein that, if folded incorrectly, never reaches its intended destination by one sequence change. So, sequence, through the process of, 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 of protein folding and so on, allows a protein to take on a characteristic structure. That characteristic structure is what enables it to carry out its function. Okay? So sequence leads to structure. We think of this as kind of a process of energy minimization, that the, uh, the surface area of this molecule is trying to keep all of its hydrophobic bits together and all of its hydro, uh, hydrophilic parts on the outside. That's one way to think about it. Think about it in general as a process of energy minimization. 
we have this process where a sequence drives itself into a structure, maybe through self-folding areas that we call domains. These domains, in turn, enable it to carry out a function. All right, now, I'm, uh, I'm not going to push into this much further there, but the, I, want you to, I want you to hold that idea really firmly in your mind. From this, we gain the ability to recognize functional bits of protein, which we call uh, self-folding bits of, of protein domains, by the sequences that are characteristic of them. I'm, I'm not going to show you examples of possums, but it's worth your knowing about them just the same. A possum, sorry, you guys don't have possums in South Africa, do you? A possums are uh, these nasty little marsupials that get into our trash in the, in the United States. Everyone thinks marsupials are, you know, so cute. Though. You know, you've got little, little boxing kangaroos and wombats and stuff, but we get possums. And possums are snarly little beasts with little sharp teeth and they mostly just want to take a nap in your garbage. That's really what they want. Uh, but they get a really rough rap. So possums are an, also an affectionate term that we use to describe position-specific scoring matrices, which is perhaps even less appealing than a possum. That's fine. Imagine that we have a region of 15 amino acids or 20 amino acids, some number of amino acids, that are characteristic of a particular function. Maybe it's a leucine zipper. That's my favorite one to talk about, what can I say? Uh, we have all these different structures. They have sequences that we have observed in the past across many different species. We can use these different exemplars of what different species have used for this particular domain to train a possum to understand where more of these may be found in the broader animal kingdom, or in the fungal kingdom for that matter. So we have different columns, each of which refers to the number of times and a, and a given amino acid has been seen at this position. And we, we can learn from that which residues are critical in this motif accomplishing its goal, because those are the ones that show the most conservation. So a possum allows us to do that. Now, possums are uh, a little like a hidden Markov model. We have each state represents one particular, amino, uh, one particular amino acid in the sequence. And it might be that its emission probability is completely dominated by serines and threonines, that that accounts for 90% of the occurrences at that position. Well, you would know then that you need to have, for example, the possibility to phosphorylate that position uh, as, as a possible biological uh, feature of the sequence. It might be that you always find a cysteine at position 10 within this motif. That cysteine might need to be there because otherwise, how you can form, form a disulfide uh, to, to lock that, that structure into place? So possums are our way of visualizing these data and making it easy to find these domains. However, everybody and his brother and his sister has derived a possum for something or other. And these are distributed on web servers around the world. Well, that's kind of a mess, because we'd really like it if everybody could present their evidence for this particular activity in the same way. So, Nicky Mulder and friends uh, all had a, a go at this, this creation of Interpro, which allows us to use one website to look for all of the major signatures that are out there in a given sequence. And, even better, the software already knows that certain motifs appear in multiple fingerprint finders, and they give them all the same accession number so you know that this is a redundant hit. That's brilliant. So they include several different ways to characterize these. We start with regexes. Have people heard of regexes? Okay, if you're a Unix person, regex is your best friend. Personally, I find them a little scary. That's okay. They stand for regular expressions. It's a common way in the, in the Linux world to express a particular pattern you're looking for. A regex that I frequently use is uh, caret greater than. Caret greater than. That might sound like a really strange regex, but I'll tell you, if you're looking at a FASTA sequence database and you want to know how many sequences are in it, looking for a greater than symbol at the start of the line is your best friend. So that's a regex that I can use to look for a pattern in a large file. People use regexes to define different sequence patterns that they expect to find. We'll probably see an example of that along the way. You also see people using possums. Possums are a more statistical model for evaluating how critical it is to have a given letter at a given position. 
We also have automated clustering, people who've used lots and lots of examples of um, a particular motif to get, to get at what, are, what features are most significant there. We see lots of people using hidden Markov models for this purpose. PFAM, SMART, Tiger Fams, all of these. So in this case, the folks at Interpro want to use all of these signatures from all these other sites, all of the sequences from Uniprot Knowledge Base, and combine them so that we can immediately say, where are all of these domains to be found in the sequences that comprise Uniprot? Very powerful. So one of my favorite proteins on Earth is the protein that paid for my car uh, back in the States, actually. Sometimes, fortune knocks. Uh, I, was, I was asked to take part in two trials for people who were accused of shipping ricin to, uh, uh, of using ricin against their enemies. Anyone heard of ricin? Ricin is, is a nasty little bugger. In the United States, if you, uh, if you grind up a bunch of, of castor seeds and run that through a paper towel, you've committed a, a, a felony uh, that can put you in prison for a very long time. Castor, uh, castor, seed, uh, castor seeds have this, uh, this casing on them that contains a protein called ricin. Ricin, if searched in Interpro, I think you might remember looking at Interpro this morning, right? Well, this is an example of a very informative report. So here we have a, uh, a, a protein that we've uh, passed into it. The protein is given right here. If you want to look it up at uh, Uniprot, that's its accession number. We see that the first hit we get is for a consolidated signature called ribosome inactivating protein. So this is one of those cases where the, the curators at Interpro noticed that different signatures created by different uh, fingerprint finders had both, both uh, encapsulated this RIP domain, ribosome inactivating protein. So one of these is coming from PFAM. I forget what SS is. That is, uh, that's probably SMART, actually. So, uh, no, I'm sorry, SuperFamily. That's what that is. So both of these different fingerprint finders have a feature that maps to ribosome inactivating protein. There's another one here, the ribosome inactivating protein type one of two. It's called Shiga rice, and this is, this is from Procyte. So those, those all hit that. And then there's yet another one. Here's uh, the Gene3D uh, database, which is kind of a domain and structural uh, look. They have another thing called the ribosome inactivating protein. So I think by this time, we've been hit over the head with this several times. We know this part of the protein is involved in inactivating ribosomes. All very good. Well, what about the rest of the protein? We've got the rest of the sequence. Aren't we getting hits there? And here we see that this layer, the IPR772, is a lectin domain. Again, lots of hits on it. Four different fingerprints all match this region to a lectin. Now that, so far, may not sound very dangerous, right? So let's get into the whole spycraft of this. How does this protein create so much danger? What is a lectin? Does anyone know what a lectin is? Lectin. It's a protein that bonds to a sugar. All right. I want you to keep in mind that most of the cells of your body use sugars on their surfaces to sort of in, I, introduce themselves to others. So when you have a protein that touches, I believe it's mannose, but I may be forgetting, a particular sugar on the surface of the cell, the cell's response to that is like the doorbell has been rung, and it opens the door and, and, and brings that protein into the cell. So this lectin can be thought of as a door knocker for the ricin protein. Getting into the cell does not mean danger. So what is the other part? That is the ribosome inactivating protein. Its abbreviation is RIP for a reason. <coughs> Your cells depend upon ribosomes because how else are you going to translate anything? You need to have ribosomes in order to create proteins. So a vanishingly small amount of ricin arrives in your bloodstream because somebody has been very, very rude to you. It knocks on the outer surface of the cell, gets drawn into the cell, and it responds by shutting down translation in your cells. Very nasty little bit. One of the reasons why this protein is, uh, uh, people are so cautious about people refining uh, the, the, the seeds of this plant is that, first off, you can find castor bean plants everywhere. They're very frequently used for landscaping. And this protein is hugely dangerous. So this is, this, is sort of, this is handled as a weapon of mass destruction in the United States. 
and the Department of Homeland Security will not appreciate it if you attempt to synthesize this stuff. Okay, so now you learned about a very scary protein. That brings us to our takeaway messages. Whew. Paired end sequencing makes a very big difference. It is our ability, uh, our ability to assemble raw sequence into long contigs is very greatly enhanced by the use of paired end sequencing strategies. We talked about some of the reasons why that's true. Repetitive sequences are problematic, and our DNA is loaded with them. So being able to screen those out before we go to the process of proper assembly is very helpful to us in avoiding making very distant features appear very close together. Hidden markup models are complex, and they do sort of something I find a little bit miraculous, frankly. Uh, that said, trying to understand them from the inside out is probably not the order of the day for any of us. But I want you to know that they exist because lots of the systems you use to answer, for example, which of these are transmembrane proteins, or where is this gene, uh, <coughs> where are the protein coding genes in a sequence, relies upon hidden markup models. So I, I really want to make sure everyone sees that. Aligning sequences via BLAST and, and FASTA and stuff like that were the original killer apps of bioinformatics. They really put us on the map. Uh, and it continues to be critically important to molecular biology. I, I hope, though, that through this course you're, you're learning that there are actually a plethora of places where bioinformatics has a crucial involvement in the fine world of systems biology. Okay, tomorrow morning, be right back here at 9 o'clock where we will be starting to look at the fine world of differential gene expression. Is that what we're up to? I'll have to look, I'll tell you. But uh, be ready for a quiz tomorrow at 2. I will try to hand back your, your quizzes to you tomorrow morning. Thank